So we'll intersect two lines. So we'll have line one of T will be P1 plus V1 T and line two, that'll be P2 plus V2 T. So it's very possible that in three dimensions, two lines never touch. They don't have to be parallel in three dimensions for them to not intersect. So you can have one in front or above the other one and they're not actually parallel, but they still cannot intersect. So what not intersecting would look like is no solution algebraically. So if we set it up and get no solution, that means they don't intersect. But probably that homework question, they probably did intersect. So how do we find where they intersect? If we change, we just think about, maybe that'll be L1, the other line will be L2. So I want to find a point in common. Now that point is going to have a T value. However, the T value for line one may not be the same as the T value for line two where they're touching. So that's where it gets a little bit tricky. So think about this point moving on line one. Maybe that, maybe that's T, when T is one, when T is two, when T is three, four, maybe it happens that t equals 5 on line 1 is the right time value where they touch. But if we look at the other line, maybe it goes, t, that's t equals 1, that's t equals 2, and where they intersect happens to be t equals 3. So they may have a different t value on each line. Because of that, if you look at the way I wrote these L of t functions, what I'm going to do in line 2, I'm going to take out t right here and replace it with another letter. So I don't want to assume it's the same numerical value. So all I'm going to do is plug in S and S like this. So I have two parameters. What is a way we can figure out when two uh, equations have the same value when they intersect? Set them equal. So let's look at setting these two equal. So set them equal and we'll get L1 of T equals L2 of S. So we have one equation, two unknowns. So you're going to have to figure out which S and T parameter values make this equal. Uh, one way to do that, you can get all your variables on one side, constants on the other. So that would be V1T minus V2S equals P2 minus P1. And then figure out the T and the S values from there. You're probably in three dimensions, I'm assuming, maybe two in that particular problem. If you're in three dimensions, there'll basically be a x, y, z. There'll be three equations. If you're in two dimensions, there'll be two equations. So either way, you should be able to use your algebra skills and figure out s and t. All right, once I get s and t, so let's say we get s, I'll just call it uh, S0 and our T value, we'll call it T0. All right, those are not the intersection points, but those are the different parameter values for when they're going to intersect. So if we go back to looking at this representation of the two lines, three and five, that's has nothing to do with the X, Y, Z coordinates where those lines touch. You have to plug in three into one of the lines and or five into the other line and get the X, Y, Z values that are happening. So what I wrote here, these are just parameter values. You'll have to turn them into x, y, z coordinates. Can we use, um, like elimination, when you're doing algebra, so this is, this is going to be linear algebra, so you can use elimination, substitution. You could put it into a matrix if you wanted to. Either of those methods will be okay. 
I think they'll probably be easy enough. You can just do substitution or elimination. They should be pretty easy equations once you have it lined up. So the algebra should be pretty easy. Setting it up, a little more tricky. That's why I went through this. Now if I didn't ch uh, change out our second parameter for a different letter, then I would only get a solution if they happen to intersect at the exact same parameter value, which is highly unlikely. So generally, if you want to intersect things, you either set them equal if they're both similar types of objects, uh, or you can plug one into the other. So if, for example, a line, the linear functions I've written down, you input a T parameter, it outputs a point. If I want to intersect a line and a plane, I take the point that it outputs and I plug in that to the X, Y, Z value of my plane equation. So I think I went through an example like that. Uh, in the lectures. So it depends on what you're intersecting as to the algebra you have to do. But setting it up can be a little bit tricky. Were there other types of intersections I didn't cover? Um, I think that was it. And there's some questions I talked about a perpendicular to a plane. That's just another way of saying the normal. So if it talks about perpendicular to the plane, that's the normal or the negative normal. We covered point to a line distance. It's a pain, so I'm not going to go back over it. But it's somewhere back in the notes. Yeah. In 12, that's all right. Yeah, I think I used the sine, the magnitude of the sine function uh, to get it. So we found an antiderivative and talked about the fast way to get an antiderivative. So let's do a word problem here. So we're going to start by supposing that we know the acceleration of plane experiences. So we have a formula for the acceleration, negative 3 cos t, negative 3 sine t, negative 2. So we're going to suppose the plane crashed at time t equals 0, and at the location, <clears throat> 3, 2, 5. So what we want to do is figure out the velocity function and the position function. So we have the acceleration, and we want to know velocity. So how do we relate v velocity to acceleration? They're not quite equal. Derivative of which? The derivative of velocity is acceleration. So derivative of velocity is acceleration. So I can anti-differentiate the antiderivative of the acceleration function, and that'll give me a velocity. We're also going to need to know if 
value for the velocity at some point in time. Which I don't want to just make one up because it may not work out nicely. So we'll just compute the velocity with a constant and then we'll figure out what would be a reasonable velocity uh, from that. <clears throat> So let's go ahead and integrate the a of t function. So find the antiderivative, and you can find it the fast way. Just anti-differentiate each coordinate. So what is missing from my antiderivative? Plus c. plus c. So I'm going to write a plus c. What type of constant is this? Number or vector? Vector. Vector. So it only makes sense. You can't add a vector to a number. So it has to be a vector. So we'll write c1, c2, c3. And we need to figure out C1, C2, and C3. So we're going to need some velocity. So I'm going to plug in 0 right here and see what we get. So we have 0, 3, 0. So let's suppose the speed is 81, whatever units we're measuring in. We never said what units, so that'll be units per second, or whatever unit per time. We'll just say the velocity is 81 and leave it, or speed is 81. All right, <clears throat> at time t equals zero. All right, how do I relate speed to velocity? Magnitude. magnitude. So this tells us the magnitude of the v0 is 81. And the magnitude's pretty easy to compute. Oh, I think we need no more information than that. That's going to be too hard to compute. So I'll just write down the vector for the speed. Let's go with 152. So 152 equals 0, 3, 0, plus C1, C2, C3. So we'll subtract 0, 3, 0 over 1, 2, 2 equals C1, C2, C3. So we have our constant C1, C2, C3 is the 1, 2, 2. We're ready to write the full V of T is... negative 3 sine t, 3 cos t, minus 2t, plus 1, 2, 2. So that is velocity of t. Now what we're going to do is find another antiderivative that will give us the position. And we have a location as well. So we're going to find the position and then use the location right there to get the constant in our position function. So 
So position will use R of T. And position is the antiderivative of velocity. All right, so that should be enough for you to compute it. So do your best to find the position function. I'll give you two minutes and get the constant out of it as well. So you'll have a constant in there. Solve your constant using the initial, oh, it zoomed out way too far, 3, 2, 5. So that's your initial position is 3, 2, 5. So on my antiderivative, I went ahead and just put the constant right next to the, inside the antiderivative vector. I could have written it as plus x naught, y naught, z naught separately, but just put it in this form here. So I already have it lined up for r of zero. So we'll just rewrite that. All right, so any questions on these computations here? So sine zero is zero, and then two times zero is zero. So it's just, I'm basically just plugging in the, evaluating all the uh, T values.
So let's look at projectile motion in R2. Oh, somehow we ended up in 13.2. So let's see, we're still doing curves in space, but Right, right here is where 13.2 should have started. So I'll do the rest of the lecture in 13.2. So this will be ideal projectile motion. in R2. All right, we'll start with the graph. Now we say ideal, that means there is no air, which is probably not ideal if you're living there, but if you're doing physics, you don't want any air because that will uh, introduce quite a bit more complicated friction into your equation. So we're gonna go with no air. And what we're gonna do is have an initial velocity and, wait, velocity is not white. What is velocity? Blue? blue? All right, so go blue for velocity. All right, there's a constant acceleration. Is that red? Or green? We'll go green. All right, we said there's no air, so there's no wind resistance or air resistance, but there is always one, well, there is still gravity, so that'll be pulling downwards. So no matter where the projectile is, I'm gonna write over here, we have the force of gravity pulling down. So we're shooting a projectile on the flat earth, no air going up at this angle. Now for the motion curve, just white, or is there another color we like for that? White's good. All right, so what does the curve look like? It definitely starts to go up, but then as gravity is pulling it downwards, it's losing the upward velocity. And eventually you have zero upward velocity, and then you'll have negative upward velocity. It'll start going back down to the ground. Now, if there was wind resistance, it would also be losing its overall velocity, or the magnitude of the velocity. So if you had wind resistance, it would look something a little bit more like that right there. It would not be a symmetric curve. You'd be losing more velocity at the beginning and less velocity when it's traveling slower. But we're not worried about that. So we're going to start with an initial velocity and then compute uh, these other ones. So we're gonna find R of T and it's gonna have two functions x of t, y of t. So according to the way I drew it, what is our initial position? Zero. So our initial position will be zero, zero, or the zero vector. So initial position, that will be r at time zero, which will be zero, zero. Our initial velocity, What would happen if our initial velocity was zero? That would be our graph right there. That'd be really boring, because it wouldn't go anywhere. So we're gonna have initial velocity that's not zero. What do we need to know about our velocity? I can either write the x and the y component, or I can use an angle and a magnitude. So we'll go with We'll go with angle and magnitude. So I'll just measure all these in the blue marker. So we're gonna have a theta and then a magnitude. I'll just write V zero for velocity of zero right there. 
So we have an initial theta, and we need a magnitude of our velocity zero. So our initial velocity will look like magnitude v zero times the unit vector cos theta sine theta. Did we compute why this is always a unit vector, cos theta, sine theta? I don't know if we've done that yet. We, we'll just, just look at this vector right here, just the unit vector part. So if we take the magnitude, it's cos squared plus sine squared, which is one square root. So this will always be a unit vector right here, no matter what angle you're pointing. So that's, we're taking the unit vector in the direction, multiplied by the magnitude, that'll give us the proper scaled uh, magnitude or scale velocity right there. All right, so that's our initial velocity. I think that is all that we need. We need to know the force of gravity. So let's be a little more specific about gravity. So we'll do this in green. This is the acceleration. Does gravity change over time? Or is it going to be constant gravity force? Constant. Now, if you get far enough away from the flat Earth, your gravity does significantly decrease. But our projectile is not going to go that far. Although, I guess, without wind resistance, it could go quite a bit further. But we're going to, again, assume that it's not going to leave a uh, gravitational field. So our acceleration. So I have force equals ma. Here's where I'm really bad at physics. That's negative mg. I'll use the vector j, or you probably like j hat. So negative mg times the vector 0, 1. That's the vector j. I should not have mass in here. I want the acceleration, not the force. I don't want the M in here. That's what's messing it up. And if I don't want that, might as well not write the A equals A. I'll just write negative M G. Nope. No M. Yes, I should not have the force there either. Wow. There we go. So it's negative gravity going downwards. So we can just write that as zero negative g. There we go. So that's the acceleration of gravity. Now, depending on your units, either nine point something or whatever the other one is. Four. What is it? Four point. Thirty-two point two. Oh, that's going to be my next guess. Thirty-two point two or nine point eight. But that assumes we're on planet Earth, which has air, so obviously, and it's flat. So whatever your gravity is, that'll be G right there. All right, so let's go ahead and compute the curve. So we're going to start with what we know. G is constant, so we're basically repeating the last process. We're going to take an antiderivative, get velocity, take an antiderivative, get position. But now we have all of our initial conditions here. So I'll go ahead and do that process right now. I'll give you a 30 second head start and then I'll take my antiderivatives quickly and get the position function.
and g is constant, g is not a function of t. So this should be your velocity equation here, v of t, with the constants. Your initial velocity is used here. So we'll take an antiderivative of this. I'm just using C1, C2 for my first constants, and I'll use C3 and C4 for my next set of constants here. Oh, that's a good question. What is our variable for integration? Oh. So yeah, we're just basically copying. The only thing that's not constant is the t and the negative gt. And I did not leave room for my constants. So I have, this is r of t, we do know initial position, r of zero, we said was zero, zero. And it's not cosine t, it's cosine theta times t. So zero plus c3 comma zero plus zero plus c4, and that equals zero, zero. C3 equals zero, C4 equals zero. We can write down our final R of T. So this is ideal projectile motion. With magnitude V0 initial speed, theta initial direction of velocity, and G is gravity.
So we'll do a projectile example, and then we'll be out of 13.2. So our projectile is fired at 500 meters per second at angle 60 degrees. Where will it be 10 seconds later? And what is the max height? And the last part. How far away does it land? So we have our ideal projectile motion function at the top. So let's talk about where we'll be in 10 seconds. How do we answer the first part? Plug 10 in for T. Plug 10 in for T, figure out R of 10. So that should be pretty straightforward. All right, max height. What are we trying to maximize? So the y component of the r function. So I'll just write y of t equals, and I'm just grabbing the second component right here, the y component, negative g over 2t squared plus v0 sine theta t. What? So I need to maximize this. So do y prime t, take derivative, set it equal to zero. That'll give you the t value to maximize. And then take that t value and plug it back in for y. That'll give you your height. All right, last, how far away does it land? What, how do we use the y coordinate for how far away does it land? Well, we will use the y coordinate. So how do I know what time it lands? When y equals zero. When y equals zero. So it lands when y of t equals zero, but the time is not how far away it lands. How do I turn the time value I get into how far away does it land? That, I'll use that t value. So let's call it t1, y of t1 equals zero. So x of t1 equals the distance it travels, it's traveled at that time. And I'll just redraw that graph really quickly, the, what the projectile motion looks like. We're going to figure out basically how far apart those two points are right there. So be careful when you get y of t equals 0, there'll be two solutions. You'll get t equals 0 or t is a positive value. So I'll give you two minutes to work on this and see how many of these you can get.
So is this gravity the 9.8 when we're in meters per second per second? Okay. So I've put a box around the R of 10. That should have been pretty straightforward to compute. But how far away? We're setting Y of T equal to zero. Not the derivative, but I want to know when it hits the ground. So that's height zero. Gives us T equals square root three over 9.8. And then plug that T value into X to get our distance away when it hits the ground. So any questions on that part there? Now we want to maximize the height, so it's y prime of t equaling zero. Now it may seem a little weird that this time value for the max height is half of the time value till we hit the ground, but if we look at the way the parabola 
looks in the graph, it should make perfect sense why half the time you'll be at max height and full time you'd be at the ground. So once we have that T value right there, we're just gonna plug it into the Y of T. Now if I wanted the X of T, I could just take the half of the full distance above. That would give me half, the, the X distance at the max height, but if I want the Y height at the max height, I have to plug into Y. I'm just squaring that t value. So it's negative 4.9 t squared plus square root 3 over 2 times that same t value. And without simplifying, that's good enough for y of, we'll just call it t1 right there. All right, so any questions on these parts that we just computed right here? Oh, I didn't care about the x coordinate for the the last part right there. I just wanted the height, the max height. Isn't there a 500 in the y uh, No, there's the four, negative 4.9 t squared. I just plugged in that weird t value to that right there. Oh, oh no. That'll mess everything up, won't it? Just slap a 500 in front of everything. So where's that 500 go? That should go onto that coordinate, or that part of the Y coordinate. Yeah. Yeah, so that'll cause some major problems. So that'll be 500, 250, square root 3. So that'll mess everything else up. So I'll just put a red box around that and call it a day. So that uh, screws up pretty much every computation down below. But it'll take too long to redo it.